The national grid copes remarkably well, but that's not to say it's working to the best it could. In fact, it is broken, but the failure has not yet shown up in a noticeable way. New power sources are being added to the grid all the time in a way that really does not suit the way the grid works. The demand on the grid is calculated to double in the near future, and concern about the environment is becoming an ever-increasing significant factor. What can be done? I'm Dave, and I'm taking on the future of the grid grid, hopefully making it fit for purpose. Now, national grids are wildly successful structure, if your sole criteria is to have no power cuts due to demand overload. So apart from severe weather events like storms destroying pylons and the odd national miners strike cutting off the grid's fuel supply, which only affect very specific regions, then the country has been incredibly power cut free for well, about ever. I don't count the Heathrow outage as that was voluntarily shut off because someone believed it would not cope. But others don't cope so well. Look at Texas. It's 2.8 times bigger than UK, but UK has a population 2.3 times larger, so it still has an awful lot of people. They regularly suffer brownouts where power is severely reduced, and blackouts where whole areas are cut off, often for days at a time winter and summer. In fact, it's common practice over there to have batteries or generators in the homes. We're not at that stage yet. So if we look back at historical generation, we are remarkably power cut free even when compared much closer to home in Europe. Remember last year, Spain and Portugal, they were totally without power. And most European countries suffer to one degree or another. But we live in a rapidly changing world and our grid, I suspect most others, were actually designed and built for a very different past era. Our grid was designed in the 1930s from the joining up of a number of regional grids which had sprung up. The idea was simple, combine them all together into a single grid, interconnect all those inter interchangeable ones so that power could be shared anywhere in the UK. The starting block, however, was that most regions built their own power stations, mainly coal, but later gas, near to where the demand was, the cities and industry. That made perfect sense as you lose energy transporting at long distance due to inefficiency. The closer you can get, the better. Well, that principle applies to the grid even today, with loads of local and regional power stations located near to the major cities. And as recently as 2005, over three quarters of that was fossil fuel based. And that has two major advantages. First, you can transport the fuel there to ensure an almost endless supply. And secondly, the fuel supply determines the output. Put in more fuel, you get more power. So before we look at how that has already changed, we need to look at how we used electricity even as recent as 60 years ago when I was a kid. Because we didn't really. I remember our kitchen had a fridge and a food mixer. I think that was it. The kettle sat on the stove, which was gas, and the oven was gas. There was a single light in the middle of the ceiling. Didn't have a freezer that I remember. Other rooms were the same, typically just had a single light bulb. And then the lounge had a TV, but the television programmes ended each evening. No 24-hour TV. And certainly no 100-plus TV channels. We had three channels initially, which didn't increase to five before 1990s. Daytime TV would be an unknown for another 20 years. And the bathroom had a bath which was used once a week or so. The hot water was supplied by an immersion heater in a copper cylinder. And that was kept cold right throughout the week unless it was specifically needed. Oh, well, the good old days. But the point is that even 30 years after the grid was formed, we hardly used much electricity. There's an interesting, extremely interesting Excel spreadsheet showing domestic electricity consumption and generating from the 1920s right through to present day. And the amount used uh, back in the 30s is so small, it's not even taken account. It doesn't even feature until about 1960. There's no real need to tell you exactly how much we use today. In the 35 years from 1965 to 2000, domestic consumption, total electricity production, each way more than doubled. And between now and 25 years time, 2050, it's projected to double from today's figures. That's a quadrupling of demand since I was a kid. So if we look at the current generation, we're moving to a more renewable grid, both for financial and environmental reasons. We find the power plants producing our electricity can no longer be located 
where we need the electricity. The most powerful wind farms are miles offshore, many miles. And the most powerful ones are off the north coast of Scotland and the east coast of England, or some of them off the west coast. And the solar farms kind of find enough land in the big cities and so end up out in the middle of the countryside. Well, looking to the future, as previously stated, transmitting electricity long distances loses efficiency. But the problem is one step worse than just inefficient. The national grid, which is essentially a huge network of pylons and cables, was never designed to transmit electricity long distances. And today actually does not have enough capacity to transmit all of the power from the offshore wind farms in Scotland down to London. At a certain point, this is going to cease to cope. And that's our problem. We are building up a dramatic mismatch where nearly all of our electricity will be generated offshore and all the electricity used will be needed onshore in major cities in the centre of the UK. That is one of the major problems facing the grid today. It is coping perfectly well right at this moment because the demand has not yet doubled, nor has the input from the wind farms increased sufficiently. But as that demand grows, things like electric vehicles, heat pumps, data AI centres, so this shortcoming will become far more important. Well, so far we've not talked anything about price. Let's do so. This mismatch in design and use has caused the ridiculous problem of the grid not using the remote wind farms because they cannot always physically use it. A wind farm off the uh, north coast of Scotland cannot send all of its electricity down to meet the demand in London because the cables just cannot take that amount of load. So instead, what the grid does is it chooses to use electricity generated locally in gas-powered turbines right on the spot and just turn off the wind farm. Yeah, actually turn them off. But of course, the government's promised to pay the wind farms for producing clean green electricity. So the government has to keep paying them even though that grid and we, the customers, are not using any of it. We actually pay up to twice what we use. And as the offshore wind farms get bigger and come on and more come online, we're going to be paying even more for electricity we won't be using. Now, renewables kick up other variables. Uh, one other factor is that renewable energy is wildly variable. The wind can just stop and start. Clouds can scoot across the sun. The grid is not designed to cater for this. It takes work. It was designed so that a single phone call to a gas per turbine could switch on a nice stable 2 gigawatt of power. And if required, another phone call could then say, right, just increase that, please. Pump in more gas. The grid cannot phone up and ask for more wind or less cloud. So our grid is heavily biased in favour of fossil fuels and enormously biased against renewable sources. This is the national grid and the government clashing over philosophies. The government says, use more renewables. The grid says, ah, oh, we'll use some, but we're quite happy as we are. So even as recently as last September, the source of fossil fuel based power stations start to close down with the last coal fired power station now dead and buried. In practice, the national grid is saying, well, we're struggling to keep what we're doing, but We've been doing it for decades. And this is where innovations come in. So just to jump away from the national grid for a second, the legacy auto industry has built up a massive infrastructure over the last 100, 120, 140 years. It's developed into an extremely financially efficient business model with multiple suppliers from around the world and just-in-time deliveries, halving, having cut costs right down to the bone. But underneath, the production of motor cars changed very little over the last 50-odd years. Factories have moved away from manufacturing and concentrated much more on assembly. And you'd think that's what they've achieved is the pinnacle of financial success and efficiency. Financial success, yes, efficiency, no, because just five years ago, an upstart EV company changed all that with the arrival of the world's first gigapress. See, previously automakers produced chassis comprising dozens and dozens of individual components, each of which has to be cut out of metal, sheet metal, stamped, assembled, welded into place to make up the chassis as we know it today in the 21st century. Tesla came along, they decided, well, instead of doing all that, let's just press a single component together using a particular type of aluminium alloy. And it was 
much less expensive, much less time consuming. They've concluded and succeeded in, you now have a front and a rear chassis, that's it. They can be moulded or pressed in a single piece in a single stage. The Gigapress was born and today many of those auto manufacturers, the old ones who used to weld all these, are themselves switching over to pressing chassis components in single pieces. Now, it, it amazes me that nobody in the entire auto industry worldwide either considered or investigated using press components. One front and rear. This, I believe, is exactly one of the problems we have with the national grid. Nobody has thought, well, maybe we could do this totally different, which is more suitable, more stable, more efficient, and possibly more profitable from the way we now generate and use our electricity. Now there is movement happening. Uh, Octopus, for example, Greg Jackson, CEO of Octopus, he's very vocal in letting everyone know that changes are needed. And they are, he's right. And he's a staunch advocate of regional pricing. So he says, instead of having a single price throughout the whole of the UK, which is usually built up to the highest, he's suggesting that we should break the UK back into regions, that the regions should be free to set whatever price they choose based on the circumstances they have and the price they get the electricity for. He claims this will have an effect of saving many billions of pounds a year, and it will. However, this approach does nothing towards what the grid is doing. It merely makes changes to how the grid charges us for our electricity. Regional pricing would mean that, for example, a small town in the very north of Scotland, close to one of the giant offshore wind farms, would be able to buy their electricity at a remarkably cheap price, saving them huge sums of money, all few thousand of them. But the same town or village on the outskirts of Birmingham, which is hundreds of miles away from the nearest offshore massive wind farm, would not see the same benefits. Yes, it would benefit from local PV farms and local land-based onshore wind farms, but the millions of people in Birmingham would not see the same th savings as the thousands of people in that Scottish town. So Greg, uh, I believe you're correct. I believe we do need to break up the national monopoly on pricing. I do support you entirely on that. And I wholeheartedly hope we can go somewhere with it. Government so far has said no. But I don't believe it goes far enough. I don't believe it solves any of the root causes of the problem. Because although regional pricing would ensure that the small town in Northern Scotland would get really cheap electricity direct from the wind farm, the much more expensive electricity generated in and around Birmingham would still rely much more heavily on fossil fuels. And we would all still be paying those offshore wind farms for not producing the electricity needed in Birmingham, London or Bristol because they can't actually send it there. So in my humble opinion, Greg, you're absolutely right. Please do what you're doing. Don't stop. But uh, maybe um, we have a look at what the grid is doing. See, the future grid is really simple to envisage. We've moved away from days where we can generate most of our electricity really close to where the maximum demand is. We're now in an era where more and more electricity generating is separated by great distances from the demand. Therefore, in my opinion, the solution for the grid is to transition from being a locally generated grid, sharing power only where necessary between short distances between regions, to what the national grid actually is, which should be a major network of cables and pylons throughout the whole country, and being able to transmit power from anywhere it's generated to anywhere it's needed. The National Grid must transition away from where it is and concentrate entirely on getting all this electricity from those massive offshore wind farms to where it's actually needed and used. The grid needs to totally update the pylons and cables and underground cable infrastructure to be able to transfer electricity from any of our offshore wind farms to anywhere where it's needed. Now, I agree, it's less efficient to transmit electricity from the north of Scotland to London. But that inefficiency is nowhere near an unsurmountable problem because that tackles only half of the problem. We're still faced and still will be faced with the intermittent nature of renewable electricity sources. But that also is a problem that has already been solved and is already on the way to correcting it. A battery, for example, can take a wildly varying input, um, supply and smooth it out and it will charge. 
That same battery, when it gives out its electricity, gives it out in a very nice stable form. We're talking here about grid-connected batteries, but not on this occasion specifically for storage, although it is. If the output from an offshore wind farm varies constantly, you can feed that into a bank of grid-connected batteries, and it will charge them. Those same batteries should then be connected into the national grid, where they will provide a nice stable power. The grid-connected batteries will therefore perform two functions. First, they'll operate as a storage mechanism, obviously storing the energy produced during periods of high wind, releasing it when the wind doesn't blow. But secondly, it will prevent the grid from being overwhelmed by variable electricity input sources. In fact, the latest development is that these grid-connected batteries are being used exactly like that, deliberately as huge stabilizers because of the nature of the power that the batteries release. So the future grid would have grid-connected batteries at all the locations where the power from offshore wind comes ashore. The power from those should be fed into the grid and can transmit it wherever it is needed. Now the grid is privately owned, but of course, there is a sticking point in that the national grid today is actually privately owned and run. But we also have Ofgem, and one of its roles, in theory, to control the national grid so it works in our favour. All it would take would be an act of parliament and for government to set down minimum standards for the amount of renewable energy being used in our national grid. This could merely be a requirement to use all the possible output from each of our massive offshore wind farms before being allowed to turn on any fossil fuel powered generator. The government should not dictate to the national grid exactly how they do this. That's for them to work out. I've come up here with an idea that might work. What the government should be concentrating on doing is making sure that the regulations result in a national grid that suits the UK population. It's absolutely crazy in this extreme that the national grid today can turn off the output from offshore wind farms and expect the government to carry on paying them for not producing. All the while, supplying overpriced electricity to the consumers, you and I, that comes from the fossil fuel, the gas-powered turbines. Once again, this all comes down to legislation. But the idea that you can just leave the national grid to do whatever's right is the very worst thing you could possibly do. Because as we've seen with the water industry most vividly, what they consider the best thing to do usually make more profit. As we discovered the water industries, it's a recipe for absolute disaster. It's going to take decades to correct. The latest government statements suggest that we might be able to halve the amount of raw sewage the water companies pump into our lakes and rivers um, by 2030. That's another five years of just pumping this stuff in. And there's no absolute certainty they're going to ask, first of all, for prices to be increased to cover it. But second, they're also going to be looking for government assistance. So for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they've been pocketing money, and now they have to do something with it. They are asking for assistance. So we must not allow the national grid to reach the same point. And luckily, so far it hasn't. But whatever the solution is, it cannot be completed in just a couple of years. And yet we're heading very rapidly towards deadlines like 2030, 2035, 2050, where major changes will be required. The time to start that is right now. Well, thanks very much for listening. I hope you found this interesting and informative. I'm sure many of you will have your own comments on both what I've suggested and what you think might be the answer. As always, please leave your comments down below. They're almost welcome, even those that disagree with me.